It's Joe Pyle from the Ladies Working Dog Group. Are you feeling stuck with your gun dog training? Trust me, you're not alone and that's exactly why you need to be here. Every week we're bringing you the best tips and hacks to make training your gun dog easy peasy. We'll keep it straightforward, no fuss, just actionable guidance that you can put straight to use. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of Found It, Fetched It. This week I'm going to be talking to our amazing group experts about some insights from their heart all about the journey and impact they have found from becoming gun dog trainers. With me this week are LWDG group experts Gemma Martin, Claire Denia and Samantha Thornycroft-Taylor. How are we all on this very warm and sunny day, ladies? A little warm, but I'm doing all right, Joe. <laughs> I am melting, but otherwise I'm very well, thank you. Yep, very warm, but it's nice to finally see the sunshine. Did it have to be this hot, though, is the question. <laughs> this topic actually falls in quite nicely with our conversation even from the beginning point of weather so it's very warm today we know from what the British Veterinary Association have told us that this is not sensible weather to be out training your dogs in the UK but for you guys as gun dog trainers even with this type of problem you get into challenges with customers in the fact that you've had to cancel classes haven't you but yes, it's all about what are you teaching, the age of the dogs, their ability and their health as well. There's so many considerations. But today it's 29 degrees here and the, our regular training field, it's what I call our HQ field, is a very large field on a farm. But it doesn't have shade and we don't have water and we don't have woodland on that field. And so 29 degrees, scorching hot weather and blazing sunshine with no cloud cover <laughs> is not sensible for training. For me, if it goes over 24 degrees, I will look at the age of the dogs I'm training. Obviously, you've got to consider there might be underlying health concerns of some dogs that you don't know about and take into consideration where I'm training. So if I'm training off on one of the other sites we use, I might have some woodland. It might be a bit cooler. But you've really got to be considerate and careful. So yeah, today, complete write-off. So let's start for all of you at what inspired you to become gun dog trainers. Was it like a moment or an experience that made you go, actually, I want to do this as a career? I think for me, it was, I had always wanted a Cocker Spaniel because I like the breed. And once I started training the Cocker Spaniel, I was hooked and decided it was something I really liked. I never really thought of it as a career at that point. I was in the police at the time and had it as my hobby. The longer I was in the police, the more I thought I wasn't going to be able to hack it long term. It was not great for me. I wasn't a good person when I was in the police. I don't think I was very nice to live with. But I wanted to do something to help people. My sort of outlook from life as a career, I always wanted to do something to help people. And if that wasn't going to be in the police, I thought maybe I can look at the things I enjoy doing. I'd been out of doing training of horses for a while at that point. And as I was enjoying my gun dog stuff, I was getting really enthused. The more I did, the more I wanted to learn. But yeah, and the rest is history, really, from there. I just carried on my journey. So I had always begged my parents for a dog growing up, but they'd quite rightly said that we weren't the right household. We were out all day and it wouldn't be fair on a dog. So when I was at an age where I could, as an adult, then go and get a dog, I got a Springer Spaniel. I had ex experience behaved Springer Spaniels growing up and sort of going farms and stuff. Uh, but I made all of the mistakes and I got it totally wrong to begin with. So I found myself a local gun dog trailer and went for a few lessons and then a few years later I married him it just it made me realize how much fun it was but also how difficult it could be and I went I knew I wanted to work outdoors and it just seemed the logical thing to then when my husband stepped away from the business we'd worked together for a couple of years but I took it on by myself um, and just wanted to help people establish a better relationship with their dogs and to enjoy their training rather than have an errant dog that they had no control of. So for me, and I got really interested in dog behaviour with our first Labrador, Gemma. She came with quite a few issues. And then when we got Indy, 
we were doing classes with her, but it was more competition style, competition obedience style lessons. Um, but we loved it. And we were studying dog behavior just as a hobby and helping a few friends out. And then when we got Indy over 12 years ago, that was our first sort of introduction to training gun dogs. And then when she got attacked, when she was two, I was told by multiple trainers that she was unfixable. I was told by people she had no quality of life. She would never make it as a gun dog. And I just didn't accept that. John and I didn't accept that. And we enlisted the help of our now good friends, Robert Elaine. And we spent 18 months rehabilitating her and found a local gun dog trainer to get her back into gun dog training with. And the rest is history. In 2015, John was being made redundant. And I said, take this. We've been studying. We've got experience. Let's go for this. Grab the ball by the horns and see how many other dogs that we can help. And I think that was based on the fact that so many people told me Indy was unfixable. It makes you think how many other people are being told that their dog is unfixable. And so that was the fire in the belly for us to start the business back in 2015 was that and it's been quite a journey ever since so for you Claire it was 2015 when did you start Sam on my own in 2010 and then working alongside Alex a couple of years before that and Jem and I'm the baby 2020 since you've all got like different ways that you've come into it different levels different reasons for all of you what were like the steps you took to get here today? I know your, your backgrounds, but did you all go and go to college and get the qualifications or did you just go off experience? What was your ways into building successful businesses? So I didn't do sort of college education thing. I had a lot of experience of outdoor animals and livestock. So it sort of, it made sense to work with animals um and then when I wanted to leave hospitality and had made all the mistakes with my dog I learned a huge amount from her and then essentially I shadowed lessons for the best part of a couple of years and I did bits of training with some of our other dogs and I learned as I went and gained experience as I went John and I both did lots of courses because we were really interested in behaviour, but gun dog training was like our passion. That was like the thing that we just loved doing, but it was the behaviour side that we were properly studying at the time. So we trained, we went on courses. We didn't go to university or college, but we did a lot of courses, workshops, and John was doing like online studying with one of the organisations as well. So yeah, practical and theory-based workshops and courses but the experience and kind of being out there like Sam said doing it is the thing that kind of really helps you grow I feel. Yeah so my degree was in something completely unrelated which is horses and that was my background I came up from breeding horses and training horses and that side of things so I suppose I had um, an experience in training animals but not necessarily dogs and I then went and did Robert Elaine's course and I've done a couple of online courses as well and looking to do some more this year. But I suppose, like the other said, it is you learn something from every dog you work with. Um, and that's a constant ongoing thing. Every dog might throw you a different curveball that you haven't seen before. So it's about using your knowledge and experience to go, OK, we've tried this. What are we going to do next? And not forgetting the lovely ladies that I'm sat here with. I've They've been my mentors for the years before we set up the business as well so I've been able to talk to them about things and bounce things off them so yeah that was my experience and like I say every day is a school day. I totally agree with you on that one I sit with you twice a month and listen to you on dog and duck answer so many questions about so many different dog challenges that you successfully help people overcome but it's just that when you're listening to a trainer talk about other dogs or their experiences with other dogs it can accelerate your learning as well can't it because you're getting that feedback about a dog that maybe isn't your dog but it's literally the case of you can learn from everyone around you as well that's exactly it and I think it is so nice that we have this community and we get to talk about what we do with dogs and, and what we see and what things work and what things don't 
But like you say, every dog is different. And the thing we always talk about, work with the dog in front of you. Even now, a few years, eight years down the line, I will learn something new from every single dog that I see. And I was working it out. And between John and I, we see about 60 dogs a week. But that's between us. So some of that is in group classes together. But some of that is like individually one-to-ones or behavioural work. That kind of, when you start thinking about how many dogs in a week, that's a hell of a lot of experience that you're gaining. And when you then think, like, only last week I met a dog for the first time and I sat and wrote a programme for that dog that was completely unique to anything I've ever done within any other dog before because that dog was totally unique. And I used things that I use with other dogs but I had to completely tailor it to this specific dog. And that's what we do. And I think that's the skill set, isn't it? That's the working with the dog in front of you part is when you can put together a unique program for a dog because you don't want any dog to kind of not have the best experience or the opportunity to thrive. Exactly that. I think being able to take your experience to then adapt it to each dog and you said and Jem said every day is a school day and you always learn something and each dog will show you something a little bit different that you can then tweak tailor elaborate upon and make it properly unique for that dog all of you what is the most rewarding part of being a gun dog trainer seeing a dog and their owner better their relationship and fulfill their goals no matter how small or large that goal is but meeting someone that potentially has got a cocker spaniel and they cannot get it to walk on a lead and it's a real bugbear just taking it down the road or even out out of the house and down the drive and just being able to help them enjoy being with their dog again for me that's a, a a massive part of why I do yeah it's definitely that relationship that you see people build with their dogs a lot of them come and say look I love my dog, but I really don't like them. I hate taking them out. I hate doing this. They drive me mental in the house. And then after you've worked with them, they're like, oh, I can't imagine not liking my dog now. I really enjoy spending time with them and we do this and do this. And those little goals that they set to start with evolve as they go. So quite often people start the gun dog work and they're like, no, I don't really want to work my dog. I don't want to do competitions or anything. And then they get hooked on it and they're like, yeah, I do want to do this. I really enjoy doing this with my dog. I want to go and do as much as I can. So watching that journey with people is in itself addictive as well. And I think if it wasn't, we wouldn't do what we do. (laughs) But yeah, that's my favourite bit. I echo that. The same for me. Regardless of ability and skill set, for me, the biggest highlight of my day or week, whatever, is when I see a dog and a handler working as a team when I can see a relationship building based on trust and see the dog making progress in whatever area it is, whether that's small or large. Of course, I think we could all sit here and agree that when you're working with the more advanced gun dogs and you're sending them on 200-yard blind retrieves and they're flying over rivers and jumps, It looks super impressive, right? And you can't achieve that really without a good relationship with the dog. We're going to say that with little brackets around it. But when I'm working with a dog who, let's say someone else has said, would never make it as a gun dog, or who you're never going to change that behaviour, or they've been to four or five trainers before me, and I can make a little change that gives that owner hope that they can do something with their dog, that is even more of a buzz for me than watching a 200-yard blind retrieve because I'm like, that person really thought that dog's day was done. That dog was never going to make it. And actually, now they're seeing there is hope and there is an opportunity to change this dog. So for me, that's absolutely huge. I think it's why I enjoy working with reluctant retrievers Because so many people go, oh, it's just that dog just doesn't want to retrieve. It just doesn't want to do it. And you just have to, I'm not saying that every dog is going to become a field trial champion. Hell no. But 
I, I haven't yet worked with a dog where we haven't found a way to motivate that dog to, to want to retrieve. And the look on that owner's face the first time they get that retrieve is just outstanding, really. So, yeah, it's the little things, isn't it? We've talked there about, like, the rewarding aspects. And I can see all your faces and you're all, like, lit up and smiling. And it, tell me about what you love the most, what makes you most passionate. But what are some of the biggest challenges you face as being endo trainers and how do you overcome them? So for me, I would say the biggest challenge is that I genuinely put my absolute everything into a client when I work with them, like my heart and my soul, probably more than I should. And I have had to learn over the last few years, because in the first few years, I probably got too deep maybe with some dogs and some people and over the last few years I think I've learned that I can't help everybody some people don't really want the help or they don't want to hear what it is you've got to say or they want to cherry pick what you're saying or because the first thing you ask them to do doesn't work they just write it off instead of saying I can't do that or I can't see that working for me and my dog and not giving an opportunity for me to delve into my bag of the 101 ways of fixing a dog. And so I think for me, that's probably the hardest bit has been learning how to deal with those emotions when I have to accept I can't help everybody or for whatever that reason that be, and that maybe I'm just not the right trainer for that person because... They don't want to hear what I need to say to them, however much I fluff it up. <laughs> Some people don't want to change, even if it's for the sake of the dog. They don't want to change or they don't want to change a thing about the way they live with that dog. So having to accept that and go, I just have to let them go and find their own way now. That for me has been a massive challenge and something that genuinely used to keep me up at night. I still think about some of the dogs and clients that over the years I know I could have helped that haven't. And I sort of say to John, if they contacted me tomorrow, I'd still help them. <laughs> He's like, I know you would. <laughs> but yeah, learning how to deal with that is absolutely the hardest challenge for me. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things is when you see masses and masses of potential in a dog and like Claire said, the owner says all the right things and they want to do the stuff, but they don't take all the advice. They cherry pick bits from here and there and everywhere. And the progress isn't as quick as you know it could be. So I find that really frustrating. And I think because of my police background, I learned really early on that I shouldn't get too emotionally invested in these dogs and the people because it's an emotive subject when people are telling you about all their problems with their dogs because it, if we're quite blunt about it, those problems affect your life, especially if it's things within the house like separation anxiety or aggression or stuff like that. So I have got quite good at distancing myself and pulling myself out from that situation so I can look at things sort of logically and, and factually um, and do my best to help people. <laughs> Sam? Absolutely. I'm going to echo everything both of you just said. We all get far too emotionally invested in our clients and their dogs and they become part of our extended family. And I, like you, Claire, I wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, I wonder if that might work. Or oh, actually they were having a, I don't know, maybe they were going to a show or even just a vet visit. And you're waiting for the message to come in to say what the vet said about the dog because you want it to be okay just as much as the owners want it to be okay. And exactly, either Claire or Jem said, I can't remember who it was, but being able to just go, okay, for whatever reason, either we don't gel as people or you're picking and choosing which bit of advice to take that I'm giving you whereas actually you need to go about the, the whole thing because there's reason for every little bit that I'm telling you and it's a circular thing you've got to encompass it all you know and we all I'm sure have clients that if they come for a lesson they go look I'm really sorry I was really busy and I haven't done much since last time and we know that life is really busy it's busy for all of us you know and work and life and children and everything gets in the way but I think when you get 
certain people that occasionally turn up and they go, I haven't really done anything, but I want to know the next steps. And if they do that two or three times, you're saying to them, look, one lesson a fortnight isn't going to change the doc. You've got to put the practice in between. So I think for me, they are probably one of the biggest challenges because you want to keep helping them. But there does come a point where you think, if you're not going to listen, I can't help you any further. And being emotionally involved, I find that really difficult. I've been seeing um, a health trauma therapist and she said them to me yesterday and I thought of you three straight away and she said, I can help you when you're with me, but when you go away, you're the one that's got to do the work. You're the one that's got to make the changes in your mindset. And I don't know what made me think of you guys, but I literally thought that's what it's like for them. When people step away from them, that person has to go and do the work with that dog because you can't come back. Like I could literally go to to see my lady once a week and sit there and not have thought at all all week about it but then I'm wasting her time and I'm wasting mine almost so do you think Claire like how do you stay motivated and resilient like in the face of like setbacks difficult training sessions when people don't put in the work oh yeah that's a really interesting one isn't it I've had to really self-educate myself on how to listen take that in and listen with intent to understand as opposed to listen with intent with an answer so I try and understand the perspective that the handler is coming from and then I just give them my totally honest opinion and view on that circumstance situation life is super busy and I would always like Sam just touched on I would always rather a client came to me and said I've just been too busy I haven't had time to do it And then if I need to recap what we did the session before, that's completely fine as long as, like Sam touched on, they're not saying, but I want the next bit. Well, it's I can't do the next bit until you've got this bit. And I will try really hard to give support, but without having boundaries in place with the clients. And I think that's really important. So I welcome them to send me videos of their progress. If I think that's going to help that person, I'll say, do you know what? And sometimes that keeps some clients on track. If they aren't seeing you for two weeks and there's nothing in between that, I find to help some people stay on track, telling them to send me a video halfway through that time in a week's time of what they're doing so that if it's not quite right I can give them support that's been quite helpful but I'm also quite strict on if you message me after a certain time of night I'm not going to be picking up that message and and looking at that video and things like that so I've had to put a lot of structure in place to help me be resilient with dealing with that kind of thing And I think one of the biggest challenges I see for the clients that I've had to learn to really bite my tongue on, and I'm sure the other ladies are going to say the same, is the clients see you, you give that advice, and then they see something on social media that is not suitable for their dog at all. And they just go, I'm going to give that a go. They don't even tell me they're thinking of trying this thing. And then they come to see me and I'm like, what's happened? (laughs) I saw this thing on social media and I thought I'd just give it a go. And I'm like, oh. So that, I think social media and the amount of information your clients can get to now online can make it very difficult for a trainer to progress a dog if they're taking this little bit of information you've given them and then going, oh, but I really like that off of there and I really like that off of there, which may be completely unsuitable for that dog and totally in contrast to what you're trying to teach as well so I think that is something else we've had to become resilient in because it's so frustrating when that happens (laughs) yeah and I think quite a lot of the time we actually become more sort of counsellors and coaches than dog trainers a lot of our work doesn't actually strangely involve the dog much because people come with this sort of whole host of issues quite a lot of the time because it's something they've sat on and it's something that's got worse or the dog's got numerous things that are going on. It's almost like they have to come to you and they brain dump all of this stuff that they've been lugging around about this dog, whether that's falling out with the family because of the dog or X, Y, and Z. Uh, So 
like Claire said, it's listening to that and taking the time to listen to that because that's really important to that person. A lot of people go, yeah, it doesn't matter. We need to train the dog. But actually, if you can't get that person on board and listen to them and their problems and their pains that they're experiencing, you're never going to help that dog. So it's doing that and maintaining that thought in your head that actually we are trying to help the dog. I'm going to siphon through all of this stuff that you've just said and see what plan we can put in place to try and help you. So that I think we've, myself and Nikki, who I work with, we've been coming at it from more of a coaching place I suppose because Nikki's currently doing a coaching qualification and we're trying to use it so once we've taught something it's making sure that person has an understanding of it so asking questions about it saying well what do you think you should do in that situation making sure that they have that thought in their head that they haven't just listened to you tell them something or show them something and gone yeah I get it it's fine because in those next two weeks they probably haven't got it and they've done it wrong so reaffirming that and like Claire, having those clear boundaries, I'm sure we've all had those phone calls or text messages or whatever at past 11 o'clock at night that we've looked at and gone, oh, I could respond to that right now, but I'm really not going to, no matter how much you want to. And it's being strong with yourself as well, because I don't think the others have got specific work phones that they turn off either. All of our phones are our personal phones, so it's always there. And things like even looking at our social media pages, I try to after a certain time on the evening, not look at my work page, but that's easier said than done. You're always need to look. Sam? Yeah, I'm not sure that I've managed to put these boundaries in place for myself yet, to be honest. What I am trying to do now, I'm tailing myself back. So now what I will do is I will look at a message and I will write the reply, but I won't send it till the next morning because then I'm not engaging in an active conversation at midnight. But Going on what you were saying there, Gem, as well, sort of, and Claire, and listening to people's brain dumps of their problems that they're having. And sometimes people will turn up and actually work that morning is what's taking up their brain space, or the children the night before is what's taking up their brain space. So it's being able to listen to them and almost comfort them through issues that aren't dog related in order to free up brain space for working with the dog in front of you but also finding that potentially slightly diplomatic way of discussing things with them I don't know if you guys have had it but sometimes if I have a couple come for a lesson and then one person is handling the dog at what at one time and you've got the other half of the couple is sat on your shoulder and they're going why did they do that they shouldn't have done that and then they shout across the field you shouldn't have done that then and you think just if they are handling the dog please leave them to handle the dog but of course you can't turn around and say would you shut up so you've got to be a little bit like I say diplomatic about dealing with things like this Claire yeah 100 percent. it is a thing we get lots and lots of couples sometimes whole families come along to watch the training and I'm just very clear like you said I'm very clear and I'm like whoever is doing the actual handling is the only person that should be engaging with that dog in that moment if the dog tries to take the retrieve to the wrong person they mustn't engage they mustn't get involved but what I found works quite well with couples is I will teach the other half of the couple how to be a good dummy thrower and how to like how to be an advantage instead of a disadvantage when they're both around the dog when they're training but yeah that definitely does and there have been times where it's been quite heated where they've all virtually you can tell they've been having some kind of debate over the dog before even turning up for the lesson and then they get out and they're already in a heated conversation and they'll be like Claire will you just tell them and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I'm not a marriage counsellor. I'm not just telling anyone. Let me listen and let me talk you through from the dog's point of view what this should be like, not from your points of view. So I always try and steer it away from them to what the dog needs. So, yeah, it is a challenge without a doubt. I think we live in a world like you all touched upon where there is so much information and so much going on at home, at life, fast pace, that training dogs in itself has become a harder job for us to disconnect from everything else and to focus on the dog in front of us. So, for example, with dogs, it could be if I was in a dog membership or a dog group, and then I'm not doing anything with my dog, stop questioning why I've got the dog. Do you know what I mean? That ongoing thought process we have when we are 
information overloaded rather than implementation focused. And um, on thinking about that, I think I think we need to like look at that across the board for all of us is how do we implement what we're learning bit by bit, chunk by chunk? How do you think that works for you guys? Yeah, so 100%. And the way that I would relate that to how I work with my clients is I'm going to pick my battles in that session. So I'm not going to try and educate them on everything and give them too much information that just blows their minds or talk in what I call dog speak. What I mean by that is like trainer speak, really. I will avoid, when I'm working with a client on the field, I will educate them on enough that gives them what they need to get the job done. But I don't want to overload them with complicated jargon and words that they don't understand and that are going to confuse them. And I'm going to maybe work on two or three things in that session to help them with their handling. I'm not going to pick on everything. For example, if I'm helping someone get their dog to walk nicely on a loose lead and I'm showing them how to reward the dog effectively, reward placement... I'm not then going to get hung up on how they're holding the lead with the other hand. They can only take in so much information. So I'm not going to overload them. So I'll pick my battles and I'll pick the thing that's most important in that session and be like, those two or three things, I'm going to keep repeating it until that sinks in. And the rest, I'm just going to have to let go until next time. Because otherwise it's overwhelming and you can make a client feel almost discouraged instead of encouraged because they feel like they're getting everything wrong and they're not it's just that you're watching and you can see all these different things but you're just going to home in on what's most important to fix today and keep that as simple as you need to so that the client can just understand it and go yes I get that and I can do that it's taking away the jargon and it's not overloading with information so that the client feels they can achieve. And it goes back as well to knowing your client as well and understanding how much information they can take on board at any one time. Are they going to get massively overwhelmed if you go into X, Y, and Z? Do we just need to focus on X today? The other thing I find helps quite a lot, again, knowing your client, what do they do for a job or a career? Can you use that to help them to understand something that you're trying to explain and put it in words that they would use themselves in that? which again is why it's so important to have that talk with your client and not just go we're training the dog it's all about the person not the dog and we often call ourselves people trainers and not dog trainers and I think that's true I think also it's sometimes about being able to like the girl said pick and choose what you're going to work on in that day but sometimes just give them a little bit of a a look to the, the future so we are doing this because it helps build up that But we're not going to go through in depth the bits in the middle yet. We're just giving you that this is why. And that often helps people understand quite a lot better as well. So when we're cherry picking which bits we're going to then work on, we've told them why. As we've discussed in our previous questions about boundaries, and I know what it's like being like self-employed, boundaries are crossed all the time I cross boundaries like the amount of times I send you guys messages like 11 o'clock and I say please don't answer this till tomorrow because I'm offloading on my head and I've got to get better actually not doing that but it, it, what it is you going through so many pieces of information again the information overload but with regards to yourself how do you deal with having a job like you do being a gendo trainer taking on board all this emotional feedback from customers about the dog not about their dog how do you deal with all that and then like personal life and personal relationships does it all bleed over I think I'm quite lucky because I have John obviously we work together but we also work independently within the business so I can discuss it with him when I'm feeling overwhelmed however John is a man and as much as I love him he doesn't always have the same thought process as me so I have you guys which is very helpful and I might ring one of you or message one of you and say this is how I'm feeling and and that can be really helpful I really do try so if I'm spent so the thing is I think we're so passionate about what we do it's really hard not to let it overspill into personal life it is hard and especially because for me 
training my own dogs is also my hobby. So my hobby and my career are together. John's quite lucky. He loves training dogs, loves it, but he has other hobbies that he does. I don't think I really have any, but actually when I think about it, I'm like, what other hobbies do I now have that I that don't involve dog training? And I think that can make the bleed really difficult to stop. So I do, if I'm spending time with friends and family whom I love dearly, and some of them are not into dogs at all, like literally at all, I do try to shut that off in my head and be like, I'm with this person. My focus is this person and this conversation. And I won't look at my phone, even if I know that a client has just sent me a video. I won't look at my phone. So I try really hard to put some management strategies in place so that my quality time with friends and family, especially those that are not dog related, is really valuable and actually that does give me time to think about other things other than thinking about dogs and my clients and the relationship between dogs and my clients so having that downtime with friends and family that isn't dog related actually is probably the only time that I'm not thinking about dogs and my clients Because inevitably, like you guys are my friends, but we have the same interests and the same hobbies. So inevitably, we end up talking about our dogs. (laughs) For me, that's pretty much how I do it. It's a bit of management and self-control. And we talk about that in dog training all the time, don't we? Management and self-control. But I have to apply it to me for me to then not let my career which is also my hobby, bleeding to valuable time with friends and family. And I think that's super important for me. I was actually having this conversation earlier with one of our society members, with Layla, and she was talking about how she started with a gun dog. And now she's got, she had a PhD in veterinary science that she hadn't done anything with. And then she became a sonographer. And that's where her business is now. She's a sonographer. And I thought, oh, it's very much like me. You start with your gun dog and then you build a business. And very much for you guys, you started with your hobby. Your hobby then became your business. And then you do get left with this, what else? So like for me, I started Sugarcraft just to have something else to talk about in my day because it it was dogs all day. My dogs, other people's dogs, the business dogs. Somebody said to me the other day about, oh, can you make me a cake? And I was like, no, don't you dare make this a business. Don't you dare. And, and I was probably a little bit excessive in my thing. And my husband was like, you could make a cake. And I was like, no, just don't. And it wasn't even about doing something for somebody else. It was the fact that I was like protecting something that was a hobby. Because it is incredibly hard, isn't it? If you haven't got those other things to find where is the boundary on talking dogs if it is your entire life yeah it's not easy and I think it's one of those things because our business is fairly quite new that I'm still not very good at is having that set time that this is my time this is what I do in this time and it's not work so at the moment generally work is seven days a week daytime evenings and there's probably not a lot of time for me to think about what I'm doing my dogs are thrown in there somewhere so they get little bits and pieces but like I used to go out kayaking and do all sorts of other things. And I started making lanyards and stuff. But again, that suddenly became a business, didn't it? And then that was boring. So yeah, it is really hard to sit yourself down and, and say, this is what's happening. This is time for me. This is time where I'm going to see my friends and family and do something for me. But yeah, I clearly lack the self-control that Claire was talking about. I think to wrap this up, because this could be a podcast in itself. Like how do you separate your passion for dogs from everything else in the day in fact we'll probably do that podcast at some point but to finish up this podcast what legacy do you guys hope leave in the field of gun dog training because that's something else that we do either directly on purpose or and think about it I'm very conscious of a legacy or we do it inadvertently without realizing the impact we have what do you want to leave when you stop being gun dog trainers what do you want to have left the world? For me, I think I would love to have left 
people believing in themselves and their ability to train their dogs and a better relationship with their dogs, fulfilling their goals and their lives with their dogs. If I can leave people feeling like they can do it and feeling like there is hope, then my job has done well. That I think that's mine. And I think for me, leaving people knowing that training doesn't have to be boring and dominating and things like that. You can have fun with your dog and still achieve the same goals and be a parent figure rather than a friend. And also hopefully leaving other people to continue the work that we've done on the same sort of veins so that work doesn't end with us, really. Sam? Exactly that, knowing that you've done your best throughout your training journey and you've worked with the clients to meet their individual needs to improve their relationship and that they've, like Claire said, they've left knowing that there is hope, there is somewhere that they can go and that it's fun at the end of the day, addictively fun, if that even makes any sense. It's quite interesting you've all said that because it makes me think as well how possibly and this is my question my next question Jim I was part of a membership about digital photography where the chap who'd built the membership died 10 years ago it was how to take a specific type of photo he died 10 years ago and his family just left the membership running so there's no new content but the value of the old content is still enough that people are accessing it and I was a bit blown away I gotta be honest I hadn't thought about it and it wasn't something that I consciously looked at that membership for but I was shocked when I realized that it was still there 10 years later and then I thought about that with relation to us people in 50 years time 60 years time 70 years time could still be learning from the content we produced and it was a little bit like not overwhelming but I was like crap that's a lot to take on board while while we leave because we are leaving a digital footprint that is so much bigger than us. And when I think about that, like you guys have all talked about how you've changed, like your one-to-one, the legs that you leave between people and their dogs, but you are leaving a, a legacy that is global. Yeah, that's a bit mind-blowing. When you put it like that's a little bit crazy and a little bit mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah. And I think then we should probably put a caveat in here then. <laughs> But if somebody's listening to this in 10 years' time, some of what we've said we might have changed our mind on in 10 years' time, and we might be giving slightly different advice. (laughs) But we all, that's the point, isn't it? We believe in evolving and learning and improving and getting better, not sticking to this is how I do it, so this is how I will always do it. So we should definitely start putting that caveat in now, just in case somebody is listening to this in 20 years time. And then they go, she didn't say that the other day. (laughs) But that is mind blowing, 100% mind blowing. And we also need to be sweet talking Sam and Joe's kids so that they can carry on the website once we're not here. That should be all right, actually. Uh, So my son likes technology and my daughter likes training dogs. So hopefully I will have a daughter that likes to carry on the business long after I'm gone. And then the son can help us all with the websites and things long after we're gone. But like Claire said, I think the thing that we've always said as trainers is that we will evolve as we learn more, as more is found out about dogs and their brains, how they work, how they tick. It's not just having a one size fits all. So even right now, we've all got multiple different ways of teaching a behavior so that we can find the one that fits with the dog. But we know that over the years that might evolve and there might be more ways or the ways that we're currently doing it might change and adapt a bit again. I think that, though, I've blown all your minds now. You'll go off this court and you'll be like, oh, my God, I hadn't really thought about this. But that, for me, is the legacy part. I already teach both my daughters how to run the business. If anything was to happen to me, it can continue. It doesn't stop for anyone. And if you think about my book and Clay's book, and I know you guys are going to get out a Christmas book, that legacy where there is a royalty attached to it, As always, this has been a fantastic podcast. Thank you, ladies, for an informative insight to the good and bads of being a gun dog trainer. For those of you who are listening, we hope you've enjoyed. Please subscribe, please review, please come along to our Facebook page, the Ladies Working Dog Group, or to 
our Instagram page at Ladies Working Dog and leave your thoughts there. We really do love hearing what you think about our content and we also love hearing what you'd like us to cover next. So I hope you've all enjoyed. I hope you've had a fantastic week and we'll see you all next week. That's it for today's episode. A massive thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to head over to the LWDG and sign up for our membership. Get access to expert-led training, a wonderfully supportive community, and the resources you need to become a confident and skilled gun dog trainer. Let's take this journey together, because no woman should have to train her gun dog alone. We'll see you all next week.